In 1995, Robbie Williams would stun millions of fans when he quit the successful boy band Take That at the height of their fame. Just two years later, Robbie would become one of the most popular and successful music artists in and outside of the UK. With multiple hit singles and a number one album under his belt, it would not be a steady climb to the top, with his label even considering dropping him from their roster, until one song would change the course of everything. The music would prevail and major success followed. Let's take a closer look at Robbie Williams's Life Through a Lens. In 1994, Robbie was unhappy with his musical ideas not being taken seriously by Take That lead singer and songwriter Gary Barlow, and eventually gave up trying to offer creative input. This frustration escalated later on when Robbie nearly overdosed on drugs the night before Take That was scheduled to perform at the MTV Europe Music Awards. My drug taking would have happened with or without Take That. You know, and before Take That, I'd done acid and speed and smoked a lot of weed. So I was sort of heading into that direction anyway. Uh, Rob went off to Glastonbury. And I remember he came back and he was absolutely wasted. And he went upstairs and uh, had a bit of a kip. Um, and he came down a bit later and Rob said he didn't want to be in the band anymore. I remember the night before we went out with the competition winner for a curry. And then uh, I went back to my hotel in Manchester, drank myself stupid again, woke up the next day, rehearsed as normal for the morning. Robbie weren't pulling his weight. Uh, he was just being quite belligerent, really. I couldn't take any information at the best of times regarding dance routines and stuff. Um, but this, these rehearsals in particular, couldn't take anything in. We did it all wrong, I think. We sat there as a, a pack, like a gang. Told him what we thought of him, that he needed to pull his weight, what's he gonna do? And they said, you know, we've been thinking about, this is how I saw it, we've been thinking about doing this next tour as a four piece. What do you think? He completely went on the defensive, just sort of completely like, listen, if you want me to leave, I'll go. And then I stood up and we used to have a table full of fruit and I picked up a melon and I went, can I take this? And everybody laughed. I walked across the room and I got to the door and I looked back at them and I think, we're thinking, this is it. And they looked at me and then I walked through the door. Following Robbie's departure, he acknowledged his plans to become a solo singer. However, a clause in his Take That contract prohibited him from releasing any material until after the group was officially dissolved, and he was later sued by Take That's manager, Martin Smith, and forced to pay $200,000 in commission. After various legal battles over his right to a solo career, Robbie succeeded in getting released from his contract with BMG, and on the 27th of June 1996, Robbie signed a new recording contract with Chrysalis Records. Robbie initially launched his solo career in July 1996 with a cover of the George Michael track Freedom, which reached number two on the UK singles chart a year after his departure from Take That. Robbie would begin recording for his debut solo album in March 1997, shortly after his introduction to songwriter and producer Guy Chambers. The sound of the album was influenced by Britpop, especially bands such as Oasis, who were hugely popular in the UK charts at that time. Has the last year been like putting the album together? It's been a while, hasn't it? Well, I'm just in the middle of doing it now, and I feel as though I'm sat on a massive secret. So 
I've got just a great album coming up. I've been in, I've been hidden away in the studio for about six weeks, and this is the first time I've seen light. And I'm growing hair all over the place where I shouldn't be. And I've got an inflamed hand, inflamed hand, and it, and it's got the blood system and it's affecting my head. And I can see Jimmy, and I can see the doors. <laughs> so anyway, what do you think the new single is going to do? <laughs> I'm just sort of a bit confused about that. Album. It's it's um it's going to do really well. Um, the radio plays really good on it. The best thing is about it. It's not the best song on the album. In fact, everything else is better than it. So. So why why if it's not the best song on the album, how comes you release it? It's the only one I've got recorded. All right. Yeah. What, what, what's the deal going to be? I mean, why has it taken so long for you to kind of lay it all down? Because, I mean, the fans have been waiting. I mean, basically, the minute you release it, it's going to do wonders. So why so long? I, I decided to take 12 months off, really, apart from releasing Freedom. Um, just took 12 months off. Of course, I've got all that legal um, stuff, and um, that's what I've been doing. So I just, I, I mean, if I thought about it, I wouldn't release Freedom. I just would have had the 12 months off and then come back with this new song. I'm feeling good about everything now. Last year wasn't too great, but this year's absolutely fantastic. Released on the 14th of April 1997, Old Before I Die was released as the official lead single from Robbie's upcoming debut album. A song co-written by Robbie alongside Desmond Child and Eric Bazilian and produced by Guy Chambers and Steve Power, the song was positively received by music critics, who were pleasantly surprised by its more Britpop, Oasis-leaning production. The single would be a top three hit in the UK, where it peaked at number two. Well, these are strange days We're living in today Say la vie, I say I hope I'm old Before I die I hope I live To relive The days gone by I hope I'm old Before I die Lazy Days was a song previously written by Guy Chambers during his time in the Britpop band The Lemon Trees. Robbie thought it was an amazing song, but made some changes to the lyrics, including hooks in arrangement and music. Lazy days. Robbie's take on the track would follow as the second single, released on the 14th of July 1997. The song was produced by Guy and Steve Power. The song became a top 10 hit in the UK, peaking at number 8 on the singles chart. Now you can be sure Our thoughts are pure We'll unlock the door And we will have And we will have A jolly good time It can happen in any season We don't need any reason 
to sit around and wait The world could change in a second So I find the sunshine beckons me To open up the gate and dream Jolly good. Let it be Correct. known that on my video shoot, while I'm smiling and pretending to be a pop star, I've got coffee, I've got coffee all over <laughs> my socks. The policeman's got pearls on, apparently indulges in live and... No, night pursuit. Night. He's a bit dodgy. I quite fancy him. Like a man in uniform. Do you like your missus? I love my missus. Hopefully she can be my real girlfriend by the end of today. Let's see what happens, folks. <laughs> I'm telling you, it doesn't get any better than that. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I thought the session's brilliant. She's looking real drab, just out of rehab. I'm talking football, she's talking about your clothes are very cute. The second day of my album shoot. It was filmed very, very well yesterday. But, good day. Let's see what happens. I'm scared. I'm so out of the room. I really am so out of the So, album shoot's finished. Kind of a happy day, very productive couple of days. Everybody seems to be happy. I'm happy, Gina's happy. The whole crew's happy, actually. And hopefully it's going to be the start of something beautiful. It doesn't matter. South of the border, the single was actually... It was I actually... was in a train station. Stoke on Trent St train station, and I'd got to go back down to London to start to pack up all my stuff to move back in with my mum last year. 
and um, I'd got a cup of coffee and I was sat waiting for my train and I thought I'll start writing a song about this, I might as well because I was pretty scared about getting out of and packing my stuff up and coming back home so that's what South of the Border is about She makes my temperature freeze She's got a blood red powder When she gives a shout She'll bring you to your knees Well we were being clever Playing God games forever She said she only meant to please But I'm someone's brother Got a father and a mother Not a lot to do though, it's just a performance idea really, isn't it? Oh yeah and There's only that one set, mm -hmm. same, isn't it? Oh. You gotta jump through a window or something The border At the last second, Robbie apparently changed his mind about the next single and made South of the Border the third release from the upcoming album. This led to the video for the single looking somewhat incohesive and mostly a performance video shoot. South of the Border would be released on the 15th of September 1997. A co-write once again with Guy Chambers and produced by Guy and Steve Power, the song would receive mixed reviews from music critics and miss the UK Top 10 where it landed at number 14 on the singles chart. You know I'm gonna have to leave south of the border I think you are the south of the border I think you are the ocean But there won't be no grieving Cause the city still forgets To me it's magic To the landlord it's tragic He's got another room to last To be the same old faces In the same old places Where my youth was well misspent But I told the line A moving time To a town called No Regrets Released on the 29th of September 1997, Robbie's debut solo album, Life Through a Lens, would receive mixed to positive reviews from music critics and debut at number 11 on the UK Albums Chart. Robbie's cover of Freedom would not make the final cut of the album. The weeks following would see the record swiftly slip down the charts. After the lacklustre performance of South of the Border and the album seemingly underperforming, many thought this was the end of Robbie's career. It wouldn't be until the release of Robbie's next single that the album would start to see significant increase in sales. This album's probably a dear diary thing that I was going through. It's um, very personal, very in depth how I was feeling, miserable in places, ironic and funny in other places. Um, I'll leave it down to the individual how they interpret it all. It's basically when I listen to songs and a lot of the time if the person that's written the songs says what it's about it lets me down sometimes because I think a lot of the songs are about me. You know, not that these people are writing them about me but you know I so understand what that person is saying and then they'll say it's written about something else and you go mm. well I'm still going to take it for me. It's down to the individual whatever they want to take from this. If there's people that they hate in the world, 
that they want to relate the album to, or if there's people they love in the world that they want to relate the album to, then go ahead, it's yours. Well, I come to call. She won't forsake me. I'm loving angels instead. I was in a band called Take That and they sold 33,000 copies of an album in 33 seconds. I'd released three singles and an album and uh, the album had sold 33,000 copies in three months and I was on the verge of being dropped and then Angels came out and Six albums later, I'm still here. So without Angels, I wouldn't have a career. And through it, oh, she offers me protection. A lot of love and affection. Whether I'm right or wrong. And down the waterfall, wherever it may take me. I know that life won't break me when I come to call. She won't forsake me I'm loving angels instead There's certain songs that define the person or certain songs that define the artist and I think Angels is definitely what you think about when you think of Robbie Williams. It was originally called An Angel Instead. I wrote it in, um, in Paris. I was living with my girlfriend and she got pregnant and we lost the baby. There's an Irish expression, you know, if a, if a baby is stillborn, um, um, he was born an angel. I love an angel instead. If I'm very honest, when we lost the baby, the, the feeling was a, a huge sense of relief, you know what I mean? Because I was only a kid uh, having a baby with a girl I didn't really know um, and her parents who didn't want me around at all. However, there is a certain loss of your, uh, your descendants. Suddenly you're very much alone on, on the earth. So that song came from that emotion. The Christmas of 96, I was back in Dublin after getting sacked. My girlfriend dumped me and I had lo we had lost this child, so I was back in Dublin kind of going starting again. I was drinking very heavily at the time and um, I was in a pub on a Saturday afternoon. And Robbie Williams walked in, who was into music as well, so very naturally we kind of found each other and started drinking heavily together and kind of formed this bond. And it just felt right to work on that song at the time. It was one song in a bag of songs, and, uh, you know, I had no idea that it was going to be, going to go on to be uh, Angels. This is the earliest version of Angels, sung by Robbie Williams and myself at, a, at a 6 a.m. in the morning, very, very drunk. That's just me on the acoustic guitar and the bell Robbie singing. This was recorded uh, in my attic on Griffith Avenue um, on a dictaphone from three o'clock in the morning till about six. We sat in this attic with an acoustic guitar and a bottle of whiskey and started to, uh, to, uh, to try and write some songs. You know, we had a bit of a verse and a bit of the chorus, the bones of the song, but it was really when Guy Chambers got his hands on it, he, uh, he really touched it up and really uh, turned it into the song it became. I heard that the song was going on his album. I got in touch. Basically, they offered me seven and a half grand. I was very naive and I took it. I was 23. Angels was the key to Robbie Williams' meteoric success of the late 90s. It sold millions. Gross earnings for the song are estimated at 7 million euro. 
when I play the song live, it puts a distance between me and everyone in the room. People go, oh, that's the guy. Either that, or they look at me going, like I'm a Robbie Williams tribute act. You know, I, I did that one night in a gig, I played Angels. And so one guy said, play Millennium! <laughs> no. So don't bore us, get to the chorus. Sing something we know, so we can all go. When you get into the music business, then you're getting into the monetary value of every song. Whatever it is, 7 million euro, communicating to 15 million people is far more important than who wrote the song. To survive and to sustain in the music industry, you need to know what the rules are. Sit and wait Does an angel Contemplate My fate Or do they know Places where we go Now we're grey and old Cause I've been told That salvation Let's their wings unfold So when I'm lying in my bed Robbie stated he wrote Angels with Guy Chambers about his aunt and uncle. However, Irish singer-songwriter Ray Heffernan asserts that he wrote the first version in Paris in 1996 and finished the song after he met Robbie in Dublin. Robbie confirmed that he recorded a demo with Heffernan but said he rewrote the song significantly with Guy. To avoid a lawsuit, Robbie bought the song rights from Heffernan for the fee of £7,500 before it was released. Angels was one of the first songs Robbie and Guy completed together. Released as a single on the 1st of December 1997, Angels would only reach a peak of number four, yet become Robbie's most well-known and best-selling single in the UK. I'm loving angels instead. Following the success of Angels, the Life Through a Lens album began steadily climbing and finally reached number one on the UK Albums Chart in April 1998, five months after its initial release. The album would eventually go on to be certified eight times platinum in the UK, selling over two million copies and more than four million copies worldwide. Q Magazine would rank the album at number 43 in their 2004 list of the 50 best British albums ever, and the album would also be included in the book 1000 2001 albums you must hear before you die.
Where are we today? We're at my video shoot for my <laughs> next single that's called Let Me In and Find You. It's not really heavy metal, I think it's a bit camp rock opera. Is he drinking my grog? Uh, look. Did you see him do it? No, he didn't see nothing. You're a bastard, Dawes! <laughs> Bitch! <laughs> Give me my grog! And it got me very excited, and it still does get me excited when I listen to it now. Um, but it is it's very Tommy, you know. It's very Tommy orientated, and I quite like it. I've just got this image of me in massive shoes playing pinball machines on stage when I sing it. Um, right, what do you want? What do you need that for? What's wrong with this one, Ned? Um, well, you see, this one's fretless. Right. Beautiful, though, isn't it? Yeah. So there you go. Right. It shoots real bullets, man. Oh, yeah. It shoots real bullets, man. Oh, yeah. Where? Out of what? It... <laughs> well, Where? not today. Yeah, not today. Obviously, not today. You know, like, bullets come keen if, if you get hit with them in the head. Right. You know, so you've got to be careful with that shit. Yeah. That's nice. <laughs> got that bit. Got that out, right? That bit. Okay. <laughs> On the 16th of March 1998, the fifth and final single lifted off the album would be the retro rock track Let Me Entertain You. It was written by Robbie and Guy with production by Guy and Steve Power and would peak at number three on the UK singles chart.
just say thanks for everybody's support in the last five years. You've been absolutely fantastic to us. But um, unfortunately, the rumours are true. Um, How Deep Is Your Love is going to be our last single together. And The Greatest Hits is going to be our last album. And from today... is no more. (laughs) Every take off your coat and tell them something. Just three years after his departure from Take That, his former group had disbanded and Robbie Williams was now the biggest and most successful male artist in the UK. His popularity would only escalate with the release of subsequent singles and albums, leaving many of his initial critics and naysayers to eat humble pie. Thanks for watching. Brown is a new